This lesson deals with lab number four, inverting and non-inverting amplifiers. Before we talk about the amplifiers, let's take a look at another loading effect of our instrument. In lab two, we looked at a DC mode of the oscilloscope. In this lab, we're gonna do an AC mode. And what that means is that there's gonna be a capacitor inserted between our measurement probe and the input face of the oscilloscope. Let's analyze this circuit at about 70 Hertz. The impedance of the capacitor is one over J omega C. And for this capacitor, it's going to be 1 over J, 2 pi times 70 times 0.022 microfarads. That turns out to be a minus 103.3 K ohms. The 8 picofarad capacitor also has an impedance of 1 over J, 2 pi 70 times 8 picofarads, and that's a minus 284.2 mega ohms. Now that 8 picofarads is in parallel with 1 mega ohm, let's find the parallel combination. It's going to be the product over the sum. The product of these two terms is 284.2 times 10 to the 12th, and the angle will be minus 90 degrees. The sum is going to be dominated by the much larger imaginary part, so take the square root of the sum of the squares, it's roughly just equal to that value. The angle is very close to minus 90 degrees, it's actually minus 89.8. So this ratio is 1 million, and the difference of the angles is a minus 0.2 degrees. For all intents and purposes, this is about 1 million ohms. That forms a voltage divider with a 0.022 microfarad capacitor. Let's find out what the value then of our displayed voltage will be. Our input is V out, which is a phasor, and then we've got this parallel combination dominated by the one megaohm resistor, voltage divided with the 0.022 microfarad capacitor, whose impedance is a minus J103.3K. Magnitude of this is one million, the angle is zero. The magnitude of this is a little bit bigger than one million, because this is so much longer than this. And the angle is very close to zero degrees, but it's in the fourth quadrant, actually equal to minus six degrees. So the displayed voltage is our measured voltage times this ratio, which is 0.995 at an angle of six degrees. Effectively, it's equal to our V out. Now as frequencies increase, the impedance of this 0.022 microfarad capacitor gets smaller and smaller. And this makes our voltage divider even closer to one. In other words, as the frequency increases above 70 hertz, this 0.022 microfarad capacitor looks like a short circuit. Let's analyze that same circuit at much lower frequencies than 70 hertz, say DC. Since a capacitor is an open circuit in steady state for DC, we can redraw our AC coupling equivalent circuit as the following. An open circuit for the 0.022 microfarad capacitor and also an open circuit for the 8 picofarad capacitor. So for measuring a voltage here, no current's gonna flow, there's no current in here, so there's no current in the one mega ohm. My voltage is gonna be equal to zero across the face of the oscilloscope. Therefore, we could say that any DC signal presented at V out is blocked and is displayed as zero volts. In other words, the following. If we had a waveform that had an average value called V sub DC, and riding on top of that is an AC signal whose value is some magnitude of V sub A times the sine of omega T. We basically have the addition of those two signals. Now we have a linear circuit, so for a DC input, we get zero out, and for an AC input, we basically pass the signal, so the output equals the input. Again, since we are using a linear circuit, we can apply superposition and add the two results. So we get zero volts added to our sinusoid, which had an amplitude of V sub A. Again, this is true provided the frequency is greater than 70 Hertz. In fact, we have blocked the DC and just passed the AC. This is important in many transistor circuits where the AC signal is very small and the DC signal is quite large. The Fluke digital multimeter also has an AC mode. And just like the oscilloscope, it sticks a series capacitor between the measured signal and the face of the instrument. In the AC mode, the equivalent circuit of the digital multimeter is a little different than in the DC mode. Here, the input resistance is about one mega ohm and the capacitance is about 100 picofarads. Now, if our frequency is greater than about 20 hertz, this capacitor, which was larger than our oscilloscope case, looks like a short circuit. And so the displayed voltage is roughly what we're measuring. We call the V out. Now the digital multimeter also has an upper usable frequency, about 100 kilohertz. In contrast, our oscilloscope has an upper usable frequency of about 500 megahertz. The scope is much better for looking at signals, but the digital multimeter is very accurate. In ECE201, we introduced an op amp and used the idea of no voltage and no current. Let me just restate that property. An op amp in a feedback circuit has the property that the voltage across and the current through the op amp input terminals is equal to zero. We're gonna use this technique for analyzing the inverting and non-inverting amplifier. We also showed in ECE201 that an op amp is a voltage controlled voltage source with a very, very large gain. It is still a linear element and so we can use our linear techniques as well as superposition. 
What's shown here is an inverting amplifier from our ECE-201 notes. You can see here I have feedback between the output and the minus terminal of the op amp. And from our zero volt, zero current property, what that implies is that the voltage across these terminals is forced to shrink to zero. So you just label that right on here. The current is zero because there's a very high resistance between these two terminals. 202, we're talking a little bit about stability and the importance of the signs that are here. And we'll also look at that in later courses on op amps. Let's analyze this circuit based on this no voltage, no current property. I want to solve for V out over V sub S, so let's just go around this loop. The rise in voltage is equal to drop across this resistor plus the drop across here. Let's call the current coming in here I1, defined in any direction, but pick it this way. So V sub S is equal to I1 R1 plus zero, so I can then solve for I1. It's equal to V sub S over R1. Now if you go around this loop over here, the rise in voltage is zero. The drop is the current in this resistor, I'll just call it I2, and then the drop of V out. So I could then solve for V out in terms of I2. It's going to be equal to minus I2 times R2. I've got V sub S and V out in terms of I1 and I2. Now, how are they related? Well, let's do Kirchhoff's current law right at this node. The current entering is I1, and the current leaving is 0 in I2. So I1 equals I2. I could take V out is equal to minus I2 times R2, but I2 is equal to I1, but I1 is equal to V sub S over R1. Then I've got V out in terms of V sub S. You can see there's a sign here, and this is where the name comes from, the inverting amplifier. If V sub S is a sine wave, then V out is a sine wave, but it's 180 degrees phase shifted. In other words, it's flipped around the zero volt reference. I can also solve for the ratio of these two, which is going to be a minus R2 over R1. Now, this is a very common circuit in electronics, especially in audio circuits, and what I'd like to do is model this so we can sort of model whenever we see this in a particular schematic. Our goal is to replace this op amp circuit with an equivalent circuit that we could use in place of this whenever we see this embedded in the design. To have an equivalent circuit, we have to have the same voltage and current properties at all terminals. So let's find those relationships. Now from analysis on the last page, we found that the current I sub S was equal to V sub S over R1. Also found that V out is equal to minus R2 over R1 times V sub S. And then if you put a load here, what changes? Well, nothing. If you put a resistor here and different resistor here, the voltage is still going to be the same. That's because this is a voltage controlled voltage source. It's in zero times infinity, but still that. They really have a zero output resistance. I did a more formal derivation in ECE 201, but this is more of a seat of the pants or common sense argument that there is no Thevenin resistance here because we have a voltage controlled voltage source. Put any load here you want, except a short circuit, and you'll be able to have exactly the same expressions. Now in lab, what happens if you do put a short circuit here? Well, the early op amps just simply melted. In later designs, like the 741 we're going to be using, they actually put a current limiter in. Violating Kirchhoff's laws here by basically forcing a voltage to take on another value causes something bad to happen. Okay, can you construct the model now? Well, this expression is Ohm's law. So if I apply a voltage V sub S, a current flows whose value is V sub S over R1. Put a resistor R1 here. The current that comes in here, I sub S, would just be V sub S over R1. This is just simply a, a voltage in terms of another voltage. So I could use a voltage controlled voltage source. I don't like minus signs. So I'm going to flip the polarity of this so that this node voltage is a negative R2 over R1 times V sub S. Put it the other way and put a minus sign here. It means the same thing. So whenever I see this symbol, I can replace it with this. And as far as these outer terminals go, it does exactly the same thing. Internally, these are two very different circuits. But what I'm caring about is what this is hooked up to. We're going to do the same trick for transistors in ECE 302 and 303. Let's take a look at another amplifier. What's shown here is a non-inverting amplifier from ECE201, where I've got, again, a feedback between the output and the input terminals of the op amp. We can use our zero volt, zero current property to say that the voltage across these terminals is driven to zero. And again, the current is zero because it's a high resistance. So let's apply that to the schematic and let's analyze the circuit. We've got no voltage and no current on the input terminals. The current that's in this resistor R2 is the same as the current in R1. We could use the voltage divider rule. The voltage across this resistor, I'll call V sub N from the negative terminal of the ground, is a voltage divider with V out. It's going to be V out times R1 over R1 plus R2 will be this voltage. We've got V out in terms of V sub N. Now what's V sub N in terms of V sub S? We'll just go around the loop here. The rise in voltage would equal the drop. So V sub S is equal to zero plus V sub N. Then I could say that V sub S is equal to V sub N, and that's equal to V out times R1 over R1 plus R2. Here I've got expression with my input and output. I'm going to solve for the output. 
by just taking the reciprocal of this and put it on the other side of the equation. So it's R1 plus R2 over R1 times V sub S, and I'll divide by V sub S. You can also write this as 1 plus R2 over R1. So here we have a gain that's positive, so we have a non-inverting amplifier. We'll take a look on the next page at modeling this. Again, our task here is to try to find a model for this circuit, because it's a very common building block in audio. Let's find the properties of the voltage and current at the terminals. The current coming in here, I sub S, is the current that goes into the plus terminal of the op amp, and we argued that that is a very small number, and ideally it's zero. The output we showed was a ratio to the input of 1 plus R2 over R1. We've got a voltage control voltage source between these two terminals. Put any load you want here, and you'll have the same voltage, except for a short circuit. And let's build an equivalent circuit from this. No current is an open circuit, so I have no current coming in here. And then the output is simply a multiple of the input. I use a voltage control voltage source with a value of 1 plus R2 over R1. Sign's positive on that, so it's going to leave it like this. A very simple equivalent circuit. So wherever you see this, you can replace this with it, or in terms of designing, kind of going in this direction, if you use this to put an idea together. At the outer terminals, these do exactly the same thing. But internally, this is a very different circuit from this one. The purpose of this lab was to take a look at the operational amplifier as a basic building block used in many electronic circuits. The concepts that we covered in the lab lecture, and also will be in the lab itself, are the accuracy of components and the instruments, the properties of an ideal op amp, and the inverting and non-inverting amplification structures. The laboratory techniques we're going to look at in the lab are the measurement of true RMS voltage using a digital multimeter, and the use of the dual trace feature of the oscilloscope for measuring gain and phase of an amplifier. When you come to lab next time, there'll be a quiz on the background material in these lecture notes, the video itself, and the lab procedure. And this is lab number four, inverting and non-inverting amplifiers.